Okay, so in um, in doing this series that Warren, I, Warren and I have been doing for over a year now, we've been accepting suggestions on chess players people would like to see covered. We've been uploading the videos to YouTube and getting quite a bit of feedback there. And that's actually what led to us doing lectures. That and feedback from you guys is what led us to do lectures on Morphe and Capablanca in the preceding two months. And this month we're going to look at Karasek, Khan, and Yezmetinov. And from there, uh, we'll finish off the requests for kind of this series that we're doing. And then next month we'll start a new series that I'll tell you about at the end of tonight's lecture. And to start, if it's your first time joining us, uh, Warren is a well, a programmer by day and a beast on ICC by night. And I'm a, librari a librarian by day, except during the summer when I'm a, a bum by day. And uh, by night, I am, I guess, an amateur chess historian by now, after a year into this. So anyway, like I said, we've gotten several YouTube requests, um, first for Karasek. And I have to admit, when I first saw this comment, I said, who? Every single one of the players that I'm covering today were complete unknowns to me when I started this about a year ago. And when I looked at several of the players that people mentioned, I found some pretty interesting similarities between the three players that we're going to feature tonight. And I thought that they were all worthy of looking at. And I particularly wanted to look at them together. And I wanted to do it now that we've done Morphe and Capablanca because there are a lot of interesting tie-ins with previous lectures. So we'll start with Rudolf Karasek. Now his name is, uh, it's, you see it as Cherusek, but it's pronounced Karasek, and he is nicknamed the Comet, probably because of his meteoric rise and his meteoric fall, which we'll get into, but it's hinted at by the uh, his vital dates there, his born date and death date. So he was born in the late 19th century. He was born actually in Prague in the Czech Republic. However, he is considered Hungarian. And the reason is, is because when he, well, he's born in Prague, but his father was actually a telegraph operator in uh, Debrecen there in Hungary. That's the left facing arrow in, in Eastern Hungary over near the border with, I believe that's Ukraine. And so he, spent his the first couple of years of his life in that area and then he moved to and I'm I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation to Miss Kolk which is the down facing arrow now he lived there for most of his childhood however it was a very tough childhood it was a childhood characterized by extreme poverty by you know parents who were working very hard to make ends meet for him and his siblings and as with with many a child in that in that social stratus, uh, he was not able to devote much time to leisure. He received, by all accounts, or by some accounts rather, he learned to play chess at the age of fourteen when he received a chess set as a Hanukkah gift. Now, sources vary on this. Some say fourteen, some say sixteen. The point is that he was quite old by chess standards, and most of the lectures that, or most of the subjects we have covered in our lecture, the children have started fairly early. Morphy, who started around age six, Capablanca, who first played at age four, uh, Karpov started very young, Kasparov started very young, Fisher started at like age five or six. So most all of the players that we've covered have started very young. Karasek is an exception. Whether he started at 14 or 16, we could agree that he came to the chess world a little late. And he also did it under the auspices of A, poverty, so lack of leisure time, and B, a lack of good competition. Now, in his hometown of Miskolk, there was really no chess club. There was no Pioneer's Palace, like which harbored a young Petrosian or welcomed a young uh, Tall. There was no organized chess scene. There were no masters around. It wasn't even like Paul Morphy, who was at least able to play a couple of masters, um, one who lived in New Orleans and a couple of others that visited from time to time. He didn't even have that luxury. It wasn't really until he went to Cossack in Slovakia, modern day Slovakia, where he actually studied law, parallel to Morphy, that he started to play chess against some stronger competition. Now, he was the strongest player in that city, but he was able to play with 
a couple of uh, strong players in nearby towns, namely Budapest, and primarily the person he played the most with was Maroxi, is a Maroxi, who we know from the Maroxi bind, which some of us have experienced and, and not enjoyed at all. And Maroxi was one of the strongest European masters at the time, and Karasek was able to play him and benefit from his tutelage. And it was really thanks to Maroxi that Karasek got his start. Now I should explain how that is. The biggest tournament in Karasek's young life occurred in Nuremberg in 1896. And you can see from the attendees, including people like Chigorin and Tarash and Lasker and Steinitz and Blackburn and Pillsbury, you know, a lot of these names look very familiar to us. This was the biggest tournament in Europe in that year and arguably within a couple of years either way of this tournament. And originally, Karasek was not invited. Nobody outside of Hungary really knew who he was. The only players who really knew him were Hungarian, including Maroxi. And so Maroxi told the organizing committee, hey, you should invite Karasek, he's a really, a really strong player. But for financial reasons, they wanted to limit the size of the tournament. So they wanted to limit it to, I think, 20 competitors or 19 competitors. Karasek didn't make the cut. What happened was, fortunately for him, Bird, the great English player, was not able to attend, and so they brought in Karasek as a stand-in. Now, this was his first major international tournament. He wasn't officially a master, and he was going, going against many, many masters, including the reigning world champion and a couple of previous world champions, and he wasn't expected to do very well. And it's not like he just went in there and dominated and won. However, he finished 12 out of 19th, which is respectable. And he did it with wins over some really strong players. He beat Lasker, for example. In the la He beat Schlechter as well. So he had some notable wins over some very good players in his first, in his debut tournament, if you will. Supposedly, Lasker was so impressed with his play that he said, I shall have to play a championship match with this man someday. Cherisek at this point is, I believe, 22 years old. He has been playing chess for maybe eight years now, you know, when he has time. And he's playing against people who have been playing a lot longer. I mean, consider someone like Steinitz, who uh, had been playing a lot longer and is holding his own. But this is where we get into the whole Comet thing, because after this tournament, Karasek goes on sort of a tear. Berlin, 1897, the following year, similar field, although Lasker isn't there, Karasek wins, goes from 12th to 1st with very, very stiff competition. He's beating people like Chigorin. He's beating people like Janowski. He's He's, doing, he's having a very, very strong showing. In fact, if you look there, he lost to Walbrot, who was a second in the tournament, and he lost to Amos Byrne. That's it. He either won or drew against the remaining field. Very impressive. In fact, what we don't see in this cross table, because of the way it's presented, is that Karasek was not even close to being in the lead for most of the tournament. After five games, he was sitting on, I think, two out of five. He had had one win, two draws, two losses. Not very impressive. After 10 rounds, he was sitting on 5.5. He's turning it around a bit, but not all that impressive. However, he goes on to win his last nine games. Nine games straight against that competition, and he's beating people like Winnower, and um, I think Blackburn was among his victims in the last nine games. Chagorin was in there as well. He goes on an absolute tear. He started the tournament slowly, but he goes on an absolute tear. Walbrot, by the way, had a, a, a forfeit in his last round. So the score, I mean, it's close, but it shouldn't even really, it may not have been that close even because Walbrot got a free win his last round. So, but anyway, Karasek climbs, climbs, climbs the leaderboard. And I think after round like 18, he's finally number one on the leaderboard and he preserves it um, in his last match. 
personality wise, we know that, well, we have accounts that Karasek was um, confident and, and full of pluck and goes for his opponent. Now, let me explain what that is, what that means practically in chess terms. It means that Karasek did not like drawing and he would play for a win. Even in a fairly equal in-game, he would still play for a win and sometimes he would lose as a result. So he was a, uh, I guess, a high-risk player, we could say. He, he went for it. And Berlin, 1897, he's at the very peak of his game at 23, right? Here is a taste of Karasek's style. I'll present this to you as a puzzle. This was a Danish gambit. It was 1893, so he's not even at his peak yet. But take a few moments and see if you can figure out White's continuation. I'll give you about 30 seconds. So does anybody who hasn't already seen this game know how it continues, John? Bishop takes uh, E6. Bishop takes E6 was not played, I no, guess, because is, pawn it, takes. Oh. Yeah, it does work if, if Bishop or pawn takes because I'm between the eight. Right, right, right. right. Queen e8, rook takes. So queen, so follow that line. Queen e8, rook takes e8. F takes equals rook. <laughs> F takes equals queen. Check. Bishop takes. Bishop takes e8, and then bishop takes d6. Mate. So you see that? Queen e8, rook takes e8, f takes e8 equals queen check. Bishop takes, followed by bishop takes d6 mate. Pretty sick. So this is the type of... Uh, so when I say Karasek was a gambling player, the Danish gambit, is, is a, as far as gambits goes, that's a pretty committed one. Um, I, I think nowadays perhaps people know how to defend it against... Uh, defend against it a little better, notably by declining it, but um, it was used to great effect. And you'll and if you look at the whole game, which is interesting, Black had a pretty strong attack going at times too, but Karasek calmly defended and um, and made it. So this is the type of player that he was. And, and if you look at it, it, it's in a sense, it's Morphe-esque. It's rapid development. It's attacking chess. And he was compared quite often as you can see in the quote at the bottom of the screen, to Paul Morphy. He was considered Morphy's successor, if you will. It was He was considered that that between Morphy, no one had set the chess world on fire like Karasek. So this is a almost a 40-year stretch between Morphy and Karasek, and he's seen as kind of the successor, and a lot of people are expecting that he is going to uh, challenge for the world championship. That doesn't happen. And the reason that it doesn't happen is because in 1898, Karasek contracts tuberculosis. If you know anything about tuberculosis, particularly in the, the treatment for tuberculosis in the 19th and early 20th century, you'll know that there wasn't much treatment. The treatment was rest, maybe going to a seaside resort and try, you know, let that ocean air maybe could help soothe the inflammation in your lungs, but really there was no way to cure it. There was no good way to prevent its um, development. You either survive through it with, you know, some lingering effects for the remaining of, of your life, or you died of it. They, they called it consumption. And, and fortunately, in Karasek's case, he died from it in 1900. So he lived to the age of 26. And toward the end of his career, he was from about 1898 to 1900. There was one instance, I believe, where he played in a tournament, although his reportedly he looked emaciated and uh, he coughed quite a bit. As we can imagine, he was in the early throes of the disease and it completely prevented him from playing in 1899. And in 1900, uh, he died from it. So this is one re so this is probably the primary reason why we haven't heard of Kar well, while why many people haven't heard of Karasek because the chess world lost him so young. So he did not play for a world championship, although there was talk about that. He in, uh, instead goes into the annals of, of chess history as kind of a what if, kind of like a Pillsbury. What if you know he would have stayed healthy? 
Um, it, unfortunately, we we lost a lot of beautiful chess, and we lost him. And to see some of that beautiful chess, we'll look at our first game of the evening. And this is against Maroxi and Cherisek, and they played a lot of games. They knew each other very well. This is was played in Budapest in 1896. And as we normally do for the analysis, I'll turn it over to Warren. Yeah, as uh, Lucas has already mentioned, he, this guy was a wild player. You know, he played the Danish Gambit, Evans Gambit, King's Gambit. Pretty much any kind of sharp opening where you just try to develop as fast as possible with little to no regard for material. So he really valued the, the time aspect of the game. So, and this uh, game with Maroxy happened to be one of these games, of course. Yeah, so uh, Maroxy himself played the King's Gambit against Karasek, but of course, in his style, he's not going to accept it and get behind the development, so he plays Valkyrie Counter Gambit. Okay, so, you know, if you're a player who likes sacrificing material for development, this is the kind of thing you play. And, of course, e4. And queen e2 is all right, although, you know, d3 is uh, a better way to handle this. E even here, white can still play d3. That's a simpler way. But the problem with knight c3 is that uh, you, you may destroy black center, but you fall behind in development. So you'll see in this case that Karasek wastes no time defending his center. He just wants to get the castle. So white goes for taking the pawn. Yeah, e even here, white should probably have refrained from taking this. Maybe d3 instead. Taking the pawn, just uh, white gets really far behind in development. So takes the knight to avoid problems on the e-file. But already black is developing really quickly. His rooks are almost connected as you know two pieces and the queen are out on good squares so white's already in a difficult position here so already black's rooks are connected and he's just so far ahead in development it's definitely a tricky position for white to handle the yeah, 94 was extremely risky you know even here white could have still maybe considered Maybe bishop d2, just try to get the king to safety. That knight e4 um, just opens up the position, and white is not ready for this. Queen jumps into d4, and now all of black's pieces are playing. You know, this is exactly the kind of position against Karasek that you would not want to be in. <laughs> Even though he is down two pawns, it's hardly relevant here. So c3 trying to push the queen back, but Karasek uh, amusingly uh, <laughs> does not remove his queen from the square. <laughs> Plays bishop a4. Now this is uh, this is already a problem for white because king d2, as you'll, as you'll see, is not good, but king e2 is no better either because why? But white's threatening the black queen though, right? I mean, queen takes d5? Yeah. Yeah, queen takes d5 might be good. Although, you know, I think uh, rook takes e4 is a move that Karasek would have played. <laughs> yeah. so, so white didn't want to have any of that, so he played king up. But now Karasek plays a really, really pretty move here. So your queen's being attacked. Unlike king e2, you can't take on e4. So do you, do you retreat, like queen f6 or something? No, if bishop before, I think white can take the, take the bishop. Well, if bishop f4, I think queen f4 is okay. Oh, if f5, I think white can take the queen. Yeah, but what sack? So one important aspect of weaving a mating net is restricting the squares of your opponent's king. It doesn't have to be a check. Yep, exactly. It's beautiful because the queen cannot be taken. Because what? Yeah, checkmate. So unfortunately for white, uh, black takes on e4 anyway, and the queen is immune because of the mate. So very beautiful. And white can't take the rook either because they've been on the bishop. So b3. So now 
White's king has a square on c2. So taking the queen is again a very real threat. So how does black keep the flame of the initiative alive? Well, rookie three, I think c takes d4. Exactly. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent square for a queen, so you don't want to lose it. Black has a fun idea. If the bishop is taken, then black will not take the rook on a1, but will play rook e3. And then you're threatening the bishop on d3, and then queen a1. Whoa. So it's really nasty. So white defends c3. Yeah, rook e3. And I think I think at this point White may have just re oh no White White played one more move yeah Queen F one defending the Bishop and now how do you finish off you've got three pieces on pre on that on that fourth rank so how do you how do you finish off the game here uh, Rook takes D three that. That that might be okay, but I think White can get away. Like Rook D three, uh, you know, you're thinking Queen F two. But I I think after King D one, for example, it's maybe not that clear. Well, Queen B two, Rook B one. I'm not sure if I see anything exactly. It doesn't look quite as clear. Yeah. No, what Black hat Black has easier here. Yep. Just putting more pressure on d3. So the queen is still immune because of the pin on the a5 b1 diagonal. And there's no way white can defend d3 anymore. So next, black's going to take on d3 and just white's going to lose massive amount of material. So yeah, at this point, I think he just resigned. Yeah, he just resigned. It's an absolute crushing game. But he played with such huge energy. You know, he, he never, never retreated. You know, he always just played the a critical move to keep his pieces active. Yeah, you know, just really instructive. Yeah. Just a great example of how to take advantage of that lead development. Definitely a, a great characterization of his play. You know, he, this guy played with enormous energy. That would have been interesting to see what he was like at the board. You know, if he was like a Kasparov or a Tal, you know, would have been interesting. I mentioned Kiroset grew up in poverty. He, as such, he couldn't really afford chess books. So most of what he learned was through going and visiting the library. And actually what he did is he hand copied many of the books in the library and copied them verbatim, essentially, diagrams and all, took it home, and that's what he studied. So he was self-educated when it came to chess. For the most part, he didn't really have strong players to play against, of course, until he got to Budapest. And he was therefore able to learn through some book knowledge, but it wasn't like Kasparov, who had, you know, the best trainers around and was flown to Moscow and, you know, had people following him and so on. So it, it was, um, he was a, an autodidact. He was self-taught. Now we come to somebody. The, the, the second request was, um, for the Sultan Khan guy. Well, I had no idea who this was, again, so I thought it would be interesting to, to look into him. And this is another example of someone with a very strong innate talent who the chess world didn't get to appreciate fully because his time in it was very, very limited. In Sultan Khan's case, it was something like five years he was active on the international chess scene, and then uh, he faded away into obscurity, and we'll get into why. So Malik Mir Sultan Khan, now he was born in British India in 1905. We don't know the exact date. Understand that British India at this time encompasses both India and Pakistan. So he was actually born in modern day Pakistan and supposedly he grew up speaking Hindu, Hindustani, which I'm not a linguist or a, a, at least that I'm, I'm not overly familiar with that branch of, 
of uh, languages. But Hindustani, as best I understand, is very similar to Hindi and Urdu, and it kind of depends where you live conversationally, which one you use. I've reproduced his name here for you in Urdu, which is spoken in uh, Pakistan. But Hindustani apparently is still commonly referred to as the kind of the standard language used in Bollywood films and such as that. So that's the language you learned as a child. It's unclear whether he could read or write in Hindustani, but we do know that he spoke it almost exclusively. And even though he grew up in British India, he did not really learn English. The reason that he didn't learn English is because Mir Sultan Khan, even though we see him in a suit here, and even though he's got the word Sultan in his name, Sultan was just a f the first name that he went by. He was actually what we would consider kind of a medieval serf. Understand India or British India at this time is still subject to a caste system, and it's also a British territory which imposes a nobility and a hierarchy in this region. And Sultan Khan is essentially a serf, essentially a peasant who is employed. And I use that term somewhat loosely. There's a fine line, I suppose, between employed and, and uh, um, serf and slave. He was employed by a Maharaja um, at, beginning at the age of 21 through the time of that uh, Maharaja's death in 1944. And then he lived out the rest of his life kind of a free man, if you will. But we'll get into that. So like I said, he was born in the northern part of Pakistan up here is um, Islamabad. And down here is Karachi. New Delhi is over here. So kind of to orient you, this is the area that he was born. This was the area that he settled in and stayed until his death. But we know him primarily because of the competitions that he participated in as a subject, you could say, of Great Britain, because India and Pakistan are territories belonging to Great Britain at this time period. He was essentially British, and so he was able to play in British championships and then represent uh, Britain, I suppose, in, in uh, European competitions. So he was, we say Indian, and I, I'll use the terms Indian and Pakistani kind of interchangeably because for all intents and purposes, it's one region at this time. This was before the partition in, I believe, 1948, before Indian independence and all that. He was, I, I guess, employed, adopted, or, you know, and indentured, I'm not sure what the correct term is, by a Maharaja, a Muslim Maharaja in, in, um, in British India. And he was essentially recruited because he was good at Indian chess. Now, I don't know if any of you have played Indian chess, it, or at least when I say Indian chess, I mean Indian chess as it was played in the 18th and 19th centuries. Nowadays, chess in India is just like chess everywhere else, but in the 18th and 19th centuries, and even in the 20th century in, in some parts of India and Pakistan, particularly rural areas, and maybe still played to this day in some parts, I don't know, Indian chess was a little bit different. Let me explain a couple of key differences. One, uh, the pawns could only move one square at a time, so there was no en passant or anything like that. Two, the queen was more powerful because the queen could also move like a knight in addition to as a bishop or a rook. The uh, king did not castle as we traditionally think of castling, but one time during the game, the king could move one time as a knight. And this is often referred to as Indian castling. The rules of pawn promotion were quite different when you reached the final uh, rank. Whatever destination square you promoted on, that's the piece that you got. So if you promoted on a bishop square, you got a bishop. If you promoted on a queen square, you got a queen. If you promoted on a king square, you got a queen. So promotion was very different. The rules of stalemate were, were different. The rules of capturing, particularly in the end game, were quite different. All of this to say that Sultan Khan was a very good Indian chess player. And when he was indentured by Sir Umar, his name was, or what I was referred to, he was taught European chess, but he started learning European chess around the age of 21. And this was uh, a different game for him, but he got very good at it quite quickly. So 1926, let's keep that date in mind, is probably when he starts working for this Maharaja and when he starts learning European chess. 
but he's not able to study any chess books or magazines or publications because not only is he uh, illiterate, at least in English, he is doing all of his notation in Hindustani. He uh, has a translator that helps him with some stuff, but the translator doesn't know chess. Translator speaks English very well, but doesn't know chess very well. So he essentially goes to Europe and starts competing with almost no opening theory. Now, he was able to play a couple of training matches and a, even a training tournament that his Maharaja had arranged for him that helped him learn some opening theory. But what Khan was known for is the middle game and the end game. He was considered one of the top five middle game players in the world at that time and probably one of the top five end game players at that time. And that probably put him in the top 10 in the world at that time. And if only he had the opening theory to go with it, he may have been uh, conceivably a world champion. Conceivably, there are some barriers to that, which I'll we'll get into. This is a picture from 1932. And I want you to get a feel for where Khan fell and kind of the chess hierarchy. Now, in this picture, we have Dr. Uh, Max Owa on the, on the left. He's standing right next to, to Sultan Khan. Khan is reading something. So this, this myth that he was completely illiterate, I think, is inaccurate. I think he, he learned quite a bit as he went along, but he certainly was never completely fluent or capable of speaking uh, English. He was able to express simple things, but there's an anecdote actually from Hans Kamok who had offered him a draw a couple of times, and in reply, Khan simply gave him a gentle smile, and um, Kamok turned and said, how do, I, how do I get this guy to understand that I'm trying to offer a draw? And finally, the game was drawn a couple of moves later, but he, he was, by all, by all accounts, a very mild-mannered, gentle guy, but he was opinionated and forceful in his, his um, thinking. And in one case, there was a, I think it was the world championship between Al Yekin and Bogol Yobov, and someone showed him one of the games without telling him who the players were. And he said, and I won't reproduce his accent, but it was, I, I think both players weak, you know. <laughs> it was like, well, okay, maybe the quality of the chess wasn't great for that particular game, I don't know. But um, he was certainly confident in his abilities, which is surprising, really. So I don't want to say that he was, um, I don't want to say that he was an outcast. I, I don't get the impression that there was ever any real animosity toward him. In fact, to the contrary, I think that a lot of players really didn't know um, what to make of him because they couldn't really communicate with him. There was this weird vibe. So there, there wasn't any real animosity, but they didn't really, you know, the players didn't really know how to interact with them. There were the, some different accounts. There are a lot of, you know, gestures and nodding and, and things like that to try to convey things. So probably his best tournament result internationally was Hastings 1930 to 1931. Um, this was a, a very strong tournament. I mean, any tournament that has both Owa and Capablanca in it in this time period is going to be a a very, very strong tournament. You'll remember Capablanca just lost his world championship to Al Yekin a couple years previous. Al Yekin didn't play in this tournament because he didn't really play in any tournament Capablanca played in until Hastings 1936. But so Mir Sultan Khan comes into this tournament as a relative unknown and he finishes third. That's a strong result, particularly in this field. Particularly if you look, there's kind of a big gap between third and fourth. There's kind of the top three and everybody else. And uh, Khan is in that top three. So strong player. And actually, he beats Capablanca in this tournament. Capablanca, if you recall from our lecture last month, was very, very difficult to beat. And this relative unknown with no real knowledge of opening theory was able to accomplish that. Here in this photo, I, I have him playing uh, Tartakower, if you're wondering. He was known, um, this is just a traditional headdress. He's not trying to throw off his opponent. It's not like the mirrored sunglasses, you know, that, that we get from a Korchnoi or something. But uh, it's just traditional headdress, which he was known for. So he was, he won the British Championship three times in four attempts between 1929 and 1934. Those were his active years in chess. And his ability to play chess was completely at the whim of his 
I want to say feudal lord. I really do because his Maharaja, because it really gives off that vibe. In fact, Reuben Fine talks about an experience, and I've got the long quote here because I thought it was pretty interesting, where they had played at this Maharaja's house in London after a, they, and, and they were invited to dinner or reception afterward. And Sultan Khan was essentially serving them drinks and waiting on them, waiting on their table. And Reuben Fine, obviously, and he expresses it quite clearly, he was quite unsettled. You know, he didn't know what to make of this. And this is where I talk about how Sultan Khan was perceived in the chess world. And this also gives us some insight into why I say that it's such a loss for the chess world, for us as chess aficionados, that he was in this situation because in 1929 he wins the British Championship and then his master, his Maharaja, takes him back to India and Pakistan or India, British India. And so he's unable to play in international competitions until I think they come back in 1931. And then in 1934, his uh, Maharaja goes back to in British India and Sultan Khan is uh, obligated to follow. I say obligated, and I say this kind of, and I've said a lot of selfish things, I suppose, about the chess world being deprived of his chess, but I should remark that Sultan Khan was not really a fan of England. I mean, the weather, okay, let's, let's admit that the, the weather kind of stinks, especially if you're from India. And by all accounts, Khan was often ill with respiratory infections. There's talk of him showing up to matches with bandages around his neck to try to keep his neck warm uh, to ward off colds. There's talk about how much he hated the food. And yes, those of us who have been to England are again nodding our heads. He thought that going back to India was pretty much the best thing that could happen for him. And he never he played in some local competitions after returning to India, but there really wasn't any point. I mean, even in the 1920s, when there had been some like championship of India or something, he had won 15 nil, like 15 wins, no losses. So he was dominating pretty much anybody that he could play against there. Didn't really have much competition. So there wasn't much point to him playing in local competitions. And every now and then there'd be some talk of trying to get a tournament going to determine a challenger to play him. But the funding really wasn't there for whatever reason, um, probably because of how one-sided it was going to be. And, um, we don't really have any chess games from him after 1934. So 1929 to 1934, I say five years, one year of that was back in India. So essentially four years worth of chess from one of the best players to ever play the game. And we just, but we just don't know much about him because um, of his weird social status and because of his limited ability to play in international tournaments. And I mentioned barriers to playing in the world championship, even if he had been uh, really well versed in opening theory, and I'm sure the Maharaja could have arranged funding to play with Al Yakin, but it was completely at his whim. If he played in England, if he played in an international tournament, it was, it wasn't his choice. That's, it's odd. It's, it's hard for me to envision such a situation, but he was a true genius. And even Capablanca said so. And Capablanca was pretty scant in giving out praise. And Capablanca was considered a chess genius himself. So for him to call someone a chess genius, that was something. He was held in very high regard by chess players for his natural ability because everything that he got was uh, his own reasoning. It wasn't book knowledge. He wasn't really able to, to follow chess periodicals. Didn't even really see the purpose for it. Wasn't really training matches because he wasn't able to get a lot of that in India. He did get some in England. It was it was mostly just him showing up and doing exceptionally well with very little knowledge of, of theoretical openings or tibias or all these all this pattern recognition and mating nets and this, that, and the other that we talk about now. He either puzzled it all out himself or he just played what he thought was the best move. Shocking, really. So let's see an example of that. Here is that match that I was talking about. I'm afraid I've already spoiled the ending, but this is Khan versus Capablanca. This was played at the Hastings tournament. And I don't know if this match was played or this game was played in 1930 or 1931, but it was under the auspices of that tournament. And again, for analysis, um, I'll turn it over to Warren. 
Yeah, this game, uh, speaking of uh, judging the player's strength based on just looking at the game, if, if you didn't know that this was between uh, Capablanca and Khan, and I asked you the strengths of the players, you would probably guess that White was uh, a far, far stronger player. Because Capablanca pretty much never got any counterplay in this game. So let's let's jump right in. So one thing about Sultan Khan, he was he was much different than Karasek. He he did not like sharp openings, probably partly because he didn't know openings, so he wanted to avoid, you know, giving away material or playing some kind of critical line. So he just played solid chess. He just played simple moves. So just queen pawn, kind of simple stuff, right? Principle though. Really, it's, it's amazing how uh, principled this chess was. Uh, principled in the respect of just developing your pieces, controlling the center, just simple, solid, good stuff. And he played which uh, an opening which later became topical in the in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s by uh, Petrosian and Kasparov. So he plays this A3 line of the Queen's Indian defense. Now, White's idea is to avoid Bishop B4. So making it harder for black to gain control of the e4 square. So uh, Kevin Blanca plays d5. Now he, he took on d5 with the e pawn. Now this is, you know, uh, pretty much just classical chess. I mean, it may sound weird, but back in those days, playing knight takes d5 uh, would would have been met with some skepticism. Really, it would have. To them, having a position without a pawn in the center looked weird. It just didn't seem like good chess to them. Although nowadays, the, the modern topical move is just knight takes d5. You know, uh, the point of taking it with the knight is to keep this bishop's diagonal open and active. And, you know, of course, you can't even expand in the center right away because of tactical reasons, right? e4 fails, just knight takes c3, and then you take e4, right? So, um, Nowadays, knight takes d5 is the more topical move. It's considered you know, more circumspect, a little bit better than e takes. It gives you a little more activity. It just gives you an idea. So e takes, bishop g5. And uh, here, Capablanca probably is a little bit too ambitious. Knight e4 ends up giving him problems for some tactical reasons, which we'll see. Uh, you know, it, it probably would have been better to just play c5 or knight d7, something like that. You know, um, so we'll see what kind of problems he gets into. So it looks like a normal position, but here uh, he poses Capablanca a tough question. So queen c2. Uh, so part of the problem black has is now if you play knight c3, you're going to lose h7. And there's also pressure on that knight. And if you play f5 like he does, you really weaken your position, and, and you'll see what Sultan does against that. But even here, it's it's hard to suggest much else. You know, uh, Knight D F six actually just loses a pawn to a really curious tactic. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really weird. Yeah, it turns out that this wins a pawn because if you take on c7, why his knight takes e4? Discovery on the queen. And now if you take on c2, white takes an f6 with check. And then after you take back, white ends up with just position up a pawn, right? And of course, Sultan would convert this. So uh, there are some tactical issues with uh, the knight on e4. So Capablanca decided on f5. Uh, but this does have a problem, knight b5. Those pawn on c7 is just rather difficult to defend. You know, a move like c5 looks bad because of knight c7. And then knight e6, right, fork on the rook. And uh, trying to be tricky with like a6 looks bad too because of just queen takes e7. So that also wins a pawn for white. So this really poses a black difficult uh, tactical issue here. So really, bishop d6 is pretty much the only move here. But unfortunately, uh, white doubles these pawns, and uh, black's real problem here is actually the, the lack of activity of that light squared bishop. It has a really hard time finding activity for it. And actually, white's play is really instructive here. Uh, 
White's a move. What do you think White should do here? So how can White improve his position? Should White just castle and then go from there? Rook to C1, C1. Uh, Rook C1, I think Black would be happy to play Rook C8 and exchange a pair of Rooks. H4. Oh, the, the queen defends h4. Is there a way to win that pawn on d6? Uh, no, unfortunately, because, yeah, if, if white takes on e4, right. like, like for example, right. you can try something like this, right? right? But unfortunately, I think black is uh, doing okay. Maybe queen e7. <clears throat> okay. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe... I might be wrong here because queen c7 actually looks pretty good, but uh, or actually, I'm sorry, maybe uh, one of d takes e4 is a good idea. Uh, yeah, I, th I think actually d takes looks better, and then if knight g5, maybe rook f6. Yeah, th this this okay. looks fine for, for black, I think. Yeah, it's worth considering. But, I mean, how should White improve his position? It's not that obvious necessarily because those nine and e four is pretty strong. So, and other than d six, it's not easy to find a weakness to attack. Well, yeah, queen b three is a useful move. That that would probably be fine here. Because rook c eight is going to gain tempo anyway. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll show you what Sultan does, and it's really interesting. It's rather principal too. So he plays h4. So I, I really like this move in this position. Uh, it just it stops any ideas that Black might have of expanding on the king side and maybe even trapping that that bishop. Uh, although right now g5 is not much of a threat, uh, it could always be in the air of g5 f4 and then getting that bishop stuck. Right. So I think h4 is is a really nice move in that respect. Also gains control of g5, which is. You know, it's a useful square to control in this position. So that's a really nice move. And then rook c8, queen b3, queen e7. And here, Sultan finds another nice move. So how do you, how do you guys think why should continue here? H6. Yeah, yeah, knight, knight g5 would be okay. Yeah. What's that? H6. Oh, it's white to play, white to play. Yeah, but if knight g5, oh. h6. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think if, if uh, White had played knight g5, I'm guessing, uh, actually, I think Black would probably play king h8 to take on e4 of the d-pawn. But, but yeah, h6 would be fine, too. I just mean in terms of like a plan and improving your position here. See, that that's I'm very happy you mentioned that, actually. Uh, castling would, would, be, uh, would, would be a mistake in this position. The reason for that is, you know, castling is good in most cases because it gets your king out of the center where it's vulnerable, right? But in this particular position, is is White's king vulnerable on e1? Yeah, actually, the center is actually pretty closed. <laughs> well, well, yeah, you 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 could that would actually have been a reasonable move to connect the rooks, but uh, White just played in in pure logical fashion here, so. What what is Black's strongest piece on the board? Yep. So he worked to remove it. Now you don't want to you don't want to take with a bishop because you'd be giving up a bishop. So I, I love his logic there. Yeah. So of course you want to. <laughs> I'm, I'm I like two bishops of course. So he wants to take with the knight and exchange that off. So that's an improvement in his position because looking here the knight at f3 is hardly a good piece for White. It's not really useful. So if we can trade this for Black's most active piece. That's really going to improve our situation, much more so than castling. You know, putting the king on the king side actually arguably makes it more, you know, of a target, right? And the rook on h1 is just fine. Putting it on f1 doesn't really help you. So, all, although it, it's it's not necessarily intuitive because we usually castle in chess, here, you know, you got to take the position for what it is. And I think Sultan's lack of theoretical knowledge actually helped him in this case. He hadn't been you know, numbed by playing thousands of games, just castle routinely. You know, he looked at his position in a new sense, you know, it was new to him, so he just thought logically. So, well, I think that's a kind of interesting aspect of this play. But okay, 
Knight f6. He takes, takes. Now bishop e2. Uh, yeah, knight takes e4. It still looks sketchy. Yeah, I, I think I think f3 is a reason. Because the knight has to go to f6, right? And then you win this pawn. Yeah, so I think for tactical reasons, he wins that pawn. So, yeah, I think f takes e4 was forced. You can't take with the d pawn because of the pin, of course. So takes and bishop e2. And this is a really, really tough position for black to hold, but it's still really interesting to see Sultan just completely outplay Kappa here. So rook c6. So trying to take hold of the, you know, the only fully open file on the board. G4. This is again, uh, just a logical move to gain space on the king side. So white wants to kick knight away from f6 where it guards d5. And then white also gets the option of bringing the bishop out this way. So we'll see both these things are useful. So rook c8, g5, knight e8. Now it, it turns out that, uh, Sultan decided not to take d5. Which is an interesting, interesting decision. Uh, but instead he just, you know, played bishop g4. Uh, but what do you guys think is the reason why he didn't take on d5? Yeah, I mean, basically the move would only really serve to open up black dice for bishop. You know, it, it can seem nat it can seem natural to just take three pawns when they rise, but, you know, when you take pawns, you should also think about, you know, how useful they are. Like in this position, d5, it protects e4. Okay, which, you know, maybe that's useful, but e4 is hardly a weakness for black. And okay, maybe it defends c4, but that's also not really useful for black. So in this position, I think Sultan didn't take on d5 because he didn't see the point. You know, it's not a valuable pawn. And another th thing to note is after queen takes d5, white would, white would be up a pawn, but extra pawns are only useful, you know, if they guard you know, extra squares. And as we've already pointed out, it's not that useful. And also if you can make a passer. But limiting white's deep pawn does not help white get a pass pawn. So I, I think that's why he didn't take it. So interestingly enough, I think many uh, of top players today or even, you know, not top players would just take d5 without much hesitation. You know, like I'm sure Carlson would just take the pawn. Like I'm, I'm sure he would have just considered this and just go back. <laughs> like, okay, I'll have a pawn, I'll just grind you down. I'm sure that's how many players would think today. But, you know, Sultan just wanted to restrict counterplay, kind of in Capablanca style. You know? So Capablanca was kind of uncomfortable here, so he decided to exchange off these rooks and create an imbalance. Honestly, I, I think what Capablanca was thinking that he could trick Sultan in this imbalance here, I think he figured that, you know, with his experience, he could somehow trick him or outplay him, but... Sultan really shows him that that is not the case. Uh, so, you know, this this position is just really nasty. I mean, uh, black pretty much is, is dead lost here. Why is black's position so bad? Why do you guys think so? He does have uh, two rooks, or he has a queen for the two rooks, right? Yes, the bishop and the knight are out of the game. Yeah, the bishop and knight are hard to get into the game. And also something that plays into black's lack of play here is the fact that it's closed. That's one of the things to think about with two rooks versus a queen. The more open the position, the better for the queen, and of course, vice versa for the rooks. And the reason is because queens are useful because they can make double attacks, right? You move it to a square, you make a fork. And the way rooks win is by ganging up on something. Because you have two rooks, you can attack something twice, right? And yeah, in this position, the only you know, open file on the board is basically the C file. So white's going to dominate that. So just keep that in mind in your own games that, you know, if the position is kind of closed, you know, winning, uh, winning your opponent's queen for two rooks is probably not going to be a good thing. So the fact that the position is so closed really makes it hard for black to gain any kind of counterplay. So let's see how Sultan converts here. He really plays with such great patience. You know, if, uh, if you told me the players were Khan and Capablanca, I probably would have said Capo was white. <laughs>
Yeah, King B2 is actually a really interesting move. You know, uh, Queen F2 turns out to be risky for even tactical reasons. Queen F2 would not even be a move I'd consider as black. Why is that? Right. Yeah, for tactical reasons, taking an F2 is not that great. But even if even if White didn't win tactically, the pawn on F2 actually does pretty much nothing for White. It defends what E3, which White doesn't need. So all you'd be doing is opening up that rank for White's rooks. So that's just something to keep in mind too. You know, again, the theme of you know pawns being useful. <laughs> just moving back to court. Yeah, it's it's hard for Black to find a target. I mean, it's fun looking at this position because everything of White's is pretty much defended. So Sultan continues to lock up the position, and of course, this is only going to benefit the rooks more. So that's why he's doing that. And yeah, Black pretty much just has nothing to do. I really find Sultan's just moving into King really interesting. He's really just hoping to triangulate the Black Queen. So he wanted the Black Queen to get on H3. So now he's intending things like Bishop G4. Like for example, if it was to move here, he could consider Bishop G4, Queen H4, F3. And this would threaten Rook H2, trapping the Queen. So he has these ideas. So Black guards G4. I think the, the bad thing about playing bishop c8 is it lets the white rook get in. But if you don't play uh, bishop c8, then you'll have to get your queen in a dodge. But then after bishop g4, it's going to be a horrible death. You know, queen e7, rook c1, and white will play bishop c8 next. Well, he's actually threatening mate right away too. But <laughs> So that, that would have been equally hopeless for black. So instead, bishop c8, but he just let the white rook in, and now he's going to lose b6. And with it, he's not going to have any counterplay. And yeah, at this point, Capablanca just gave up. He can't stop the advance of that b-pawn. Yeah, I think this game was just really, really instructive, you know, how... Sultan handled the position. He he approached it just like a like from a fresh. You know, he didn't let you know, previous you know notion of other positions. He didn't just cast automatically or anything like that. So I think we can all learn something from that. You can often get stuck in your way of thinking. So it's it's good sometimes to try to forget about the thoughts you had before about a given position. I find it fascinating. Warren says he if if he wouldn't have known who the players were, or if he knew who the players were but not the colors. He would have thought Capablanca was white. It's kind of like uh, he beat. Ca I, I, it's kind of like Khan beat Capablanca at his own game, which is just so precise and so patient in his his play. Okay, we have uh, we have one more player, and uh, again, this comes from um, requests from viewers, and I hadn't. I had heard mention. Of Yezmet Dinov before uh, I I encountered his name and Warren pointed it out as to me as well that he was discussed in the Soviet chess book by Soltis that I used in my Soviet school of chess lecture. I didn't discuss him at all or even mention him at all, at all in that lecture, but he is mentioned a couple of times in that book. So I had seen the name before, but I had no clue what he had done. It was interesting for me to look into it. So Rashid Nyesmet Dinov, and I'm not entirely sure that I'm pronouncing that properly, but I think it's close, was a Soviet player. He was born in uh, Kazan, which is, which well, he grew up in Kazan, which is part of the USSR, but he was born and then he, lay, he spent the remainder of his life in what is currently Kazakhstan. It was part of the USSR when, uh, when he was a child, but it's current day Kazakhstan. Uh, we'll get to that. Born 1912, died 1974, lived a long, fruitful life, just like Sultan Khan, but you may not have heard of him because uh, for various reasons, he didn't play in many international competitions, and we'll get into the why in a moment. So let's orient ourselves. He was born in a small little town called Aktobe, or what it is currently in Kazakhstan, very near the border with the USSR. Grew up in Kazan. This is the Volga River. Um, and, you know, just a quick, 
quick drive or train ride, I guess. Well, not really. That's uh, Russia is a big country, but to to Moscow, and yet he was very isolated from the Russian chess scene. He he didn't. You know, he didn't have the means to, to really travel and play professionally in Moscow himself. And so, essentially, he had to wait for Moscow and the Soviet chess establishment to summon him to be able to play. So his parents died when he was very young, and because of that, he was moved to a children's home in Kazan, which is where he spent quite a bit of his life. Uh, he was there in 1921 when they had a pretty massive famine in the USSR, and fortunately uh, lived through that. He was old enough to actually serve in World War II, and we'll get into that, he did. But what I found most surprising about Yazmetinov is that of all of the Soviet players, he is tied for the most uh, USSR championships. From 1950 to 1958, he won the USSR championship five times. Now, I grant you that not every year you didn't always have Botvinnik and Smyslov and Tal. You, you didn't always have, or Bronstein. They didn't always participate in the USSR championship. But despite that, we can agree that there were some very, very strong players in the USSR at this time. And Yezmetinov won that championship five times. Now, what's even more surprising, well, I mentioned he wasn't part of the chess establishment, so let me back up there. In Kazan, he attended the uh, Pioneer's Palace, and we've heard about the Pioneer's Palace oh so many times with so many great Soviet players. What had happened was he grew up speaking uh, Tartar, not Russian. He learned Russian later on. But at the age of 11, the story goes, he was playing hide-and-seek in a building, and he comes across a newspaper clipping, and it's a column from a chess magazine written in Russian Cyrillic, and he doesn't really understand it at all, but he's fascinated. So he goes home and he deciphers it, and that leads him to the uh, Pioneer's Palace in Kazan, where he starts learning chess at age 11. By age 14, he is the strongest player in Kazan. He's thrashing the competition. A month after he wins the city championship, he takes up checkers. Why not? You know, he's really good at chess. Why not take up checkers? Most of us go about it the other way. We play checkers first, and then we kind of graduate to chess. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, checkers is more of a simple game not to uh, besmirch people who are really, really good at checkers. But um, checkers is one of those... <laughs> well, <laughs> Okay, we're going to be elitist here for a moment. Yeah, we're we're going to be elitist and remind and remind people in the hierarchy of tabletop games that checkers is a solved game currently. Computers have completely solved it, um, and just like tic tac toe, I guess there's not much point in playing it anymore. And and at this point, the Go players in the audience are going, Haha, "We're still beating computers at Go." Ha ha! Take that, chess players. So anyway, he he took up checkers. I think this is in 1928 or 1929. He takes up checkers. This is like the month of February. Uh, he had just won the city championship in January, and by April, he is. The, the city champion at checkers, three months after he starts playing. By June, he is the champion of the uh, of a certain group of territories, not the whole of the USSR, but a, a big chunk of many of the different territories of the USSR. He is the champion five months after he starts playing checkers. So he's actually freakishly good at checkers. And then from 1929, it doesn't really appear that he played checkers at all, all the way through World War II even. But at the end of World War II, the story goes that he is at a championship for checkers in Kazan as a spectator. And the one of the competitors withdraws, and they ask him, because he's in the audience, hey, do you want to step in and play? He hasn't played in 15 years. He goes, yeah, I guess so. So he plays and he wins. <laughs> he wins the whole tournament and he goes on to win the USSR championship in checkers. So he is not only a USSR champion in chess, he is a USSR champion in checkers. He also is one of about 30 people who is named a distinguished trainer for chess 
um, Alexander Nikitin um, was one of them, and there were uh, many others, but he was one of the preeminent chess trainers and authors in the USSR. And he was also a darn good mathematician. David Bronstein talks about how solid and how brilliant he was at mathematics. Now, I suppose for those of us following this, this series, this shouldn't be overly surprising. There are a lot of chess players who have shown that they were prodigies, not just in chess, but that that translated into other things except normal social re relations in Fisher's case. But it's translated into a lot of other things, including mathematics, economics in the case of Karpov, law in the case of Morphy, Karasek, uh, Al Yakin was a, a, an attorney as well. It you know, there have been physicians who were chess players. We've talked about that, talked about trash in a previous lecture. So this this genius and this talent, it, it doesn't always uniquely apply to, to just chess. And in fact, in the USSR, you could not be a professional chess player. But Vinik was an electrical engineer, and Taimanov was a concert pianist, etc. And uh, Yezmet Dinov was a mathematician. So establish that. He was also really, really good at checkers and really, really good at chess, well-respected as an author, well-respected as a coach. And yet we've never really heard of him. Why? Because he was only allowed to compete in one international tournament in his entire career. One. So he was summoned to Moscow in, I believe, 1948 to play a, to play a match to earn his master's title which he drew is like plus four, minus four equals six. And uh, he was allowed to come and train in Moscow from time to time. And once he won the USSR tournament in 1950, then he was deemed a master of chess in Russia. And as part of Khrushchev's effort for what we call, or what historians call de-Stalinization, Khrushchev was trying to encourage more Russian or Soviet chess players to compete abroad at the same time. But the Soviet Union, you remember, as part of its cultural Cold War, was trying to dominate chess globally. And they were doing a pretty darn good job of it. This led to a lot of complaints from other countries and, and the chess world at large saying, you know, you always send the Tals and the Smyslovs and the Botviniks, but you never send you know, your other masters, your up and coming masters. Why are you afraid? So as, as, as kind of a reply, in 1954, Russia decided to send a couple of up and coming players, kind of unknown players, to compete in Bucharest. And they included Korchnoi, Nezmedinov, and Kolmov, who were top three out of four for the uh, Bucharest tournament. And I think after that, the chess world was like, whoa, 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 whoa. okay, <laughs> you made your point. <laughs> um, so he attends this tournament in Bucharest in 1954, and he finishes right behind Viktor Korchnoi, right behind him. And we know what Korchnoi went on to do. We, we covered him in one of these lectures. And we recognize, like Gideon Stahlberg, the great Swedish GM, we recognize a lot of other players at this tournament. And Nyesmet Dinov did very, very well. After this tournament, FIDE accorded him the title of international master. And he kept that title until, I, I think he stopped playing actively in the early 70s. I think by the time he stopped playing, he had an ELO somewhere around 2450. So he never quite reached the GM title, although for all intents and purposes, I think he was playing at uh, GM strength. You'll remember my contention that uh, ELO is kind of inflated over time. So in today's playing strength, I think he would be a lot higher than 2450, maybe 2600 ish. So I think he was a GM caliber player that never attained the GM title because uh, primarily because the authorities, the powers that be, didn't allow him to play in international competitions. This was the only one he played in. He went on to win many USSR championships after this tournament, but he never competed internationally ever again. And I couldn't find a good reason why. Yeah, I, I, I think it could be because, that's that's my theory as well, that, that not only was he Muslim, but he was a Tartar. So he was an ethnic minority 
obviously with a name like Rashid. Now, you may remember in my Kasparov lecture that Gary Kasparov was born Gary Weinstein, and he was counseled by his coach that he would have a very hard time being promoted in the Soviet chess establishment with a name like that, and that may have probably did influence his de decision, although he kind of ascribes it to other reasons, for his decision at age 12 or 13 to change his name to Rusify it to Kasparov, get it Kasparov. So it, it could be that, that Kasparov decided to kind of play the game to downplay his uh, Azerbaijani origins and, and to play up his Soviet origins. And it could be why uh, Nismet Dinov was not allowed to advance, really, in the Soviet chess establishment, despite very high praise from his contemporaries. Bakvinik, Bronstein, Averbach, they all spoke highly of his abilities, his tactical abilities. And he had a plus record against people like Mikhail Tal. He had a plus record against Boris Spassky. In fact, he had a plus record overall against world champions. I was, I was remarking upon this before the lecture. I don't know very many people who can make that claim, who have, you know, who have played it, I guess, if your sample size is one, maybe. But with a sample size as big as uh, Nezmetinov, I, I don't know many people who can make that claim. And yet, he was never allowed to participate in international tournaments beyond that Bucharest 1954. So he was considered a virtuoso of combinational chess by Bronstein. Botvinnik talks about combinations. We're talking about tactics. Averbach talks about his uh, strong attacks. In fact, many people considered that he was a stronger attacker than even Tall. Here's a position from that Bucharest tournament in 1954, the only one that he was allowed to play in internationally. White to move. Last move, black played e5. Take 30 seconds and see if you can figure out what white plays here. Guesses? I'll, I'll tell you that G takes F7 is on the right track, but there is a, a kind of, a, I guess, an intermezzo, not an intermezzo, but there's a, there's a move order issue here. There's something that he plays first. I heard it mentioned. I heard it suggested. B3. It, the queen it, C3. it is indeed B3. B3 is what was played. Now, I'm not well-versed enough in chess to tell you why that is. I, I will just tell you that the computer says, the engine says that B3 is just crushing. It puts white up like plus eight. Yeah. <laughs> Two nights on the engine. <laughs> yeah. So it, the, the continuation is B3, queen takes knight, and now we have G takes F7. King D8. And then can you see how to proceed from there? Queen takes g7. Queen takes g7. Now we play queen takes g7. Yeah. And it is lights out for black. <laughs> because you're... You can't stop the queen. You can't stop the queen. Wow. So when we talk about combinations, when we talk about tactics... This is what uh, Botvinnik is, is talking about. This is what Bronstein's talking about. They're talking about the ability to see moves like B3, which to me are just, they, you know, I don't, I don't see B3 at all. I could stare at this 10 minutes. I don't see B3. Warren might. I, I hope he probably does, actually. But, but this, in fact, this game earned uh, Nesmetinov the brilliancy prize for the tournament. And I don't want to say that B3 was the move. Probably was. I mean, there are other strong moves in this game that are certainly worthy of exclams. If you want to go through the whole thing, and I suggest it, it's, it's not a very long game. As you can imagine, it, it only goes about five or six moves after this. Earned him the brilliancy prize, and incidentally, Yasmet Dinov had heard the night before this match that his wife had given birth to their son. And the following day, it's kind of a cool story, he sends a telegraph to his wife saying, congratulations on the birth of our son. I hereby dedicate my uh, victory over Paoli, you know, to our, to him. So he, you know, dedicated this game and the brilliant, before he won the brilliancy prize, he probably knew it was pretty special to his son. So this, this is the, the style that we're seeing here. So just a, a very keen eye for a very keen eye for, for these sorts of tactics. All right, let's look at 
uh, a full game. But Paul Ugayevsky, this is uh, a well-known Russian player, uh, certainly a um, uh, one of the strongest players and often used as a trainer to prepare some of the world champions for their matches. And even said, uh, had very high praise for Nezmetdinov himself. And I think we'll see why uh, as an illustrative example in this particular match. And this one's an absolute delight. And again, for that, I will let Warren regale you with this one. And his opponent, Kologayevsky, had been in the candidate cycle and had been very close to becoming a challenger for the world championship. So his, his opponent was uh, by no means a weak player. So, you know, as, as Lucas has told you already, Nezhmetinov was really a, a blood seeker. <laughs> he didn't play the Queen's Gambit declined a whole lot. <laughs> no, he didn't even go for that. Yeah, he was a, a King's Indian kind of guy. Plays a little bit of an unusual opening. Plays this e5 move. Kind of invites, at least, I don't know if anybody are putting it, you know, to the, to the amateur who's told, you know, oh, this is never good because you trade queens and the king can't castle. It turns out that endgame really is not that good for white. Uh, part, of the, part of the reason for that is you lose queens, right? So it's harder to take advantage of that first move with white. And secondly, it has to do with the weaknesses white has on, on b4 and d4. I mean, just... Just to briefly show you guys, uh, yeah, White has these weaknesses on d4 and b4, which turn out to make his game kind of inconvenient. Actually, in GM games, Black has actually scored better here. So this, this end game is by no means very good. So if you're encountered with this, you know, don't go into the end game. Uh, and and Polagaisky's move e4 is okay, but Knight f3 is is theoretically the best reply here. Just invites play back into normal old Indian or King's Indian territory. In the game, Paul Gajewski tried to just play e4, but of course the downside is uh, it does give Black this tempo of development with knight e6, although it's possible. Now he, here is actually already an interesting point in the game. So Paul Gajewski plays queen d2, so why would he block his own bishop with the queen? Well, what what's his intention? Yeah, so queen d2 just basically indicates that he's going to develop his bishop by b3 and bishop b2. Now, the advantage of this is that it could possibly challenge black stars for bishop when he will likely feel in keto. But this move has a couple downsides. Part of the downside of playing queen d2 here is it's not efficient. So the reason it's not efficient is you already had an open diagonal for your bishop. And instead, you spend another move just to develop it on a, on a long diagonal. So... That's a downside of not being efficient. Now, you know, one of the upsides of queen d2 is that it does help you connect your rooks in this position. You know, because once you develop all your minor pieces and get castled, your rooks will be connected. But, uh, do you think that's valuable in this position? To connect your rooks quickly? Not really. The position is kind of semi close right? There aren't really open files for the rooks to get to. So in my opinion, I think queen d2 is already a slight mistake. I think uh, instead of queen d2, why should play queen d1 here? And you can develop the bishop normally and save that tempo and development there. The other advantage, there's also an advantage, which you'll see later, to keeping an extra white piece of the king side. <laughs> Given Nezhmetinov's, uh, Nezhmetinov's uh, style, you probably guess why. It's good to keep pieces around your king, but <laughs> you, you'll see why later. Okay. So queen d2 anyway, g6. So now we have kind of a faux, kind of king's Indian kind of position, right? Now bishop d3, e4 is a bit of a weakness in this position, so I guess white was trying to shore it up. And now knight g4, so already he brings his knight to a good square. Now it's thematic in these kind of positions where white has so many pawns on light squares to attack in the dark squares. So by moving the knight here, you bring a piece closer to the king, and you open up this bishop. So it's kind of a thematic move for this position. Knight e2, queen h4, so threatening f2, although, you know, Nezhmedinov is not just trying to threaten the mate, he's trying to accumulate the cloud of pieces around the king. So, that, that's the primary intention, not just to checkmate white, okay? Uh, knight g3, defending against the mate, knight e5. Now, of course, normally you would like to capture bishops, at least in my mind, but... 
Exactly, exactly. In this position, uh, knight takes c3 would be a mistake because white's bishop is basically useless. It's a, it's a glorified pawn, basically. So here it's better to keep the piece to give yourself additional attacking possibilities. So f5, another thematic king's Indian move, right? f3, bishop h6. Now, normally in the king's Indian, you don't have the ability to do this, so this is quite a luxury for black to be able to activate this bishop on this diagonal. The other positive thing about this move is it will support the black pawn when it arrives on f4. So it'll make it easier for black to attack. So queen d1, f4, knight e2, g5. So black's attack is just moving very swiftly. So knight d5, this is white's first kind of hint at counterplay here. So it may be threatening c7. But this is Nezhmedinov. He's going to attack. Okay, so why why did not why did White not take on c7? This would have been a well specifically yes g3 is a, a crusher. Problem is that h3 fails to a typical King's Indian sack. Exactly, bishop takes h3. This is why people tell you life spread bishop is so important in the King's Indian, so you can make this kind of sacrifice. And of course. The bishop is basically immune because white's getting mated here. Okay, But yeah, the, the king's Indian is a very sharp opening. Uh, part of the reason is that in the king's Indian defense, you're, you have less space, you give your opponent greater control of the center and queen side, but, but you do accumulate pieces around the king so you can attack. So it's a very, uh, it's a kind of position or opening where you, you burn your bridges. You know, you are at a positional disadvantage, but uh, the, the problem problem for white in the king's Indian defense is that black's target is very expensive. <laughs> the white king, right? I mean, white's target on the queen side, it's just material. So it's a very, very, very complicated, interesting opening. But yeah, anyway, although this wasn't exactly a king's Indian, it's, it's very similar to those positions. So in this case, white has no time for knight takes c7. So g3, trying to stop white from black from playing it himself. Now, of course, the downside of this is you open up black stars for a bishop. But, you know, white hardly has much defense anyway. So it takes, takes, queen h3. So again, white has little choice because black is threatening just knight f3. So f4, shutting out the bishop and the rook simultaneously. So it looks pretty nice. And if you're a team off here, what do you play? And knight f3 is not so clear because after king f2, it's, you know, what's the follow-up, right? Uh, bishop takes f4. I think rook takes f4 is okay for white. Uh, I don't quite see continuation from there. So it, one, of the, one of the things to think about here is what is white's threat, right? So if it were white's move here, what would white do? Yeah, I mean, f4 threatens a black knight, right? So white is threatening, f takes e5. So black has to deal with this threat. And we've already determined that knight f3 is maybe not the right move here because white's king will run to the queen side. Well, knight g6, that's a, that's a retreating move. You know, for example, knight g6, just king f2, threatening rook h1. So you're in a, you're in a very critical position here. And of course, again, you don't want to take a bishop on d3 because that's a terrible bishop. On e5? Not right now. If it were white's move in this position, he could just play f takes e5. But you hit on the right idea. So we don't want to move the knight, it's well placed. Exactly. But how can you do that? The knight is well placed. You don't want to move it. You have to make f takes e5 a very bad choice for white. One thing to note is that right now, if you take on e5, white is one step away from disaster because bishop e3 almost almost mates. So challenge that knight on d5. How can we do that? Knight e7 obviously fails. Just takes it for free. Knight b4, the same deal. Exactly. Bishop e6. So that's kind of how you break down this kind of complicated position.
So now f takes e5 would be a poor choice because there's a bishop takes knight, and the threat of bishop e3 would be kind of hard to stop. So bishop c2. Rook f7. Now king f2. So white decided to get it to dodge. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work out so well. Queen h2. King e3. Bishop takes. Take. Knight b4. Now rook h1. Black is in a critical position now, though, because it looks like a skewer. I mean, what do we do? Sacking the bishop doesn't look good. Just bishop f4, just g f4. If you play queen g2, then white can just take your bishop. But what do we do? Well, knight takes c2, queen takes c2, looks okay for white. Yeah, I mean, it looks it looks like uh, Black's attacks kind of run out of steam. Well, one one thing to remember in these kind of positions is every exchange, you know, reduces the amount of material you have to attack. You know, knight takes c2, queen takes c2, gets rid of one more piece you could use to attack. So when you're just kind of critical position where you're trying to make your opponent's king, really try to reduce the exchanges you make, unless there's like some really specific reason. Oh, well, again, queen g2, rook takes h6, and it's it's not so clear where the follow-up is. Yeah, queen f3 looks nice, but king d2, it's hard to say what you go from there. So yeah, it's a critical position. This is the kind of moment in the chess game where you should definitely think for a while if you have time. <laughs> Sack the queen. How do you do that? Well, take e2, looks like, you know, king takes. Yeah. Yeah, queen takes h1, just queen takes h1. And, uh, you're not going to get enough material. Well, queen g3, knight g3, bishop f4, king e2, I think white can survive that. You guys have the right idea. You see the right sacrifice. Ah, now you've hit on the right theme. So, so White has a problem here. If uh, if Knight takes f4, it kind of leads to disaster. Actually, Black is even better. Yeah, Knight takes c2. Turns out the White King is one of the squares. The Black Queen very nicely covers that. Well, white can't sacrifice the queen, but it's a very bad position for white now. So knight takes f4 is impossible. Okay, what if uh, g takes f4? Yeah, the same theme. Bishop f4, right? If knight f4, knight c2, and again, white's going to lose that queen. So white decided, well, all those are bad, so let's let's see what you got. Let's take the queen. Unfortunately, this uh, doesn't lead to such a good position. Rook f3, double check. King has to go forward. <laughs> this reminds me of a phrase, uh, I don't know who said it, but someone told me a while ago, uh, a real king leads his army into battle. <laughs> this position definitely fits that position quite quite aptly, I think. So 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 now the king's in the center of the board, almost mate, but there's there's no mate right away. So how do we how do we continue the pursuit? A uh, bishop e three, king c three. That doesn't. I don't know if that's entirely clear. Looks like white might be able to get away. That, that might work, but I think white's actually okay there. Now, there, there, there are a couple roads to roam here, so... Although, I, I admit, I think Neshmedimov's uh, move was the most stylish. However, in the theme of mating nets, you want to restrict the king, right? Oh, by the way, I'll tell you one way to win, and you, you can actually play a b5 to take away c4, and you're actually threatening just c5 and, and a quick mate. You know, for example, a3, c5, right, and then checkmate. <laughs> so that's one idea. But 
Neshmedimov chose uh, an arguably more stylish solution. Yeah, he, he chose just bishop g7. Yeah, there's something satisfying about being down a queen and just playing a quiet move like that. So this sets up the bishop on the long diagonal, so now the knight on e5 can move with the double check. And, you know, white doesn't really have a, a great defense here. Now, he does have a couple of moves he could have played, maybe challenged Nechmedimov a little bit, but... Uh, no, he, he continued. Uh, he played a4, which, you know, quickly lost, as you'll see. I guess he had a couple other alternatives. I guess knight c3 was a little bit better, but, you know, we don't care about what would have been last the longest. Regardless, white is in big trouble here. So a4, and now c5. Takes is the only move. Takes. So again, c5 mate is a threat. So bishop c3. White had to give himself that c3 square. The knight takes. King c4. And now, now what, what's next? Yeah, d5. Yeah, we're, we're not going to play knight takes b2. We're not no, hunting. No, no, we're not no, hunting no. queens here. No. So d5 takes. King b5. Now what? <laughs> Yep. <laughs> now knight c6. Yeah. And at, at this point, white resigned. Yeah, because it's mate two, right? Yeah, after king a6, black has a, a nice choice between three different mates. Yeah, knight c5. So, holy crap, knight Now, where was the queen side? That was back, I mean, knight c5, knight b4. Yeah, rook b6. Rook b6. Out of a poll, what do you guys think is the most stylish mate? I think the knight d b4. Knight db4? Personally, I prefer knight c5 because it maximizes yeah. the number of unprotected pieces I have. But, you know, to each their own, you know. You could consider knight b4 more pleasing because of the opposite, right? But, yeah. yeah. It's definitely a fun game. You know, you don't you don't see many games where you get to sacrifice your queen and checkmate, you know, so many moves later on like that. Or bring the queen king from the... King yeah, 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 this this queen, th this king had a a march on the trail of tears <laughs> to f two and e three and d four and c four and b five and a five and then a six. <laughs> That's a very sad plot of the king. But most of the time, those were only moves. Yep, White hardly had any choice in any of these points. But there's still some a little bit of variation. It seems like, and it's like those types of things. It's like. Yeah, I, I doubt he calculated. He probably saw the king in the center, saw it was so restricted, and thought he's not getting out. I mean, in that kind of position, you can't calculate everything. So. so that was in his, like, yes. Oh, was this in that tournament? Oh no, no, this was not in that tournament. Yeah. Sorry, no. This yeah, because because he played full of guys. This was in the USSR championship. Yeah. Yeah, this is definitely such a fun game. I mean, this uh, when you see a game like this, you know, even if you're not a King's Indian kind of player, it makes you want to play it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about this? He played a Sicilian game against Tal, and Tal lost, but Tal was like, "This was like the happiest loss of his life <laughs> because he, he thought the game was so great, and then he invited him to." To join his team to help him prepare for the for the uh, his team's uh, world championship match. So that's mm -hmm. that was actually on his team when he played uh, on that. Oh. And as we typically do at the end, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, sources. Now, frankly, there are not a lot of sources about the three players that I've talked about tonight at least in English. There are a couple of great books that have been written on prominent Soviet players, including the Kotov book and the Soltis book, which I've discussed. Uh, Karasek's Games of Chess by Philip Sargent. Philip Sargent was a prominent chess historian in the early 20, early 20th century. Like I think this book was published around 1915 or so. Unfortunately, it's got quite a few inaccuracies in terms of, you know, where Karasek was born and, and what age he started playing, et cetera. So it's, it's, it takes a disparate group of sources to, um, to piece together the kind of history. And I haven't gone into great depth 
about these players, A, because that wasn't the point of the lecture, but B, because I don't really feel comfortable doing that because of the paucity of, of good sources about these players. However, there are an, uh, plenty of games for these players, and I think the games can speak for themselves. So I'd encourage you, if you've enjoyed any or all of the players featured today, to look into their games, and, and uh, chessgames.com, as typical, has a, a good um, number of them. Okay, there, I, I want to talk a little bit about the future of what we're going to be doing uh, in terms of presentations. Were there any questions about the material we covered tonight? All right, so what's coming up? Well, Warren and I originally set out to do a year's worth of episodes of the life and chess of, and we ended up doing uh, 15, so you got three bonus episodes, I suppose. Next, what I wanted to do, and Warren's graciously agreed, is we're going to look at the upcoming candidate cycle. As you know, the World Chess Championship will be contested in fall of 2016 between Magnus Carlsen and the winner of the current candidate cycle. And that candidate's tournament is going to be occurring throughout the month of March. Uh, in fact, most of the month of March, and I think most chess fans around the world will be following that fairly closely. And I thought it would be interesting to look at the candidates themselves. And so each month from now until February of 2016, we're going to feature one candidate and we're going to look at their biography. Now, this is a little bit challenging because in the case of some of these players, they are 22, 23 years old, and we have to rely not necessarily on books, but on interviews, but that means um, more primary sources. And most importantly, we're going to look at their chess and see how their style will match up against uh, Carlson. Carlson, for the longest time, we thought was pretty much untouchable, but in this current tournament going on in Norway, or I don't know, may have just wrapped up, he's shown himself to be somewhat vulnerable. And so it'll be interesting to see if one of the up-and-coming candidates can dethrone him, or if, you know, he'll have a, a long reign as chess champion, as he would certainly like. So in the current candidate cycle, the way it works is there are going to be eight candidates. The runner-up, uh, Vishwanathan Anand, who, who we know about already, he's going to be um, in the automatically seated into the candidates, candidates uh, tournament. And even if he wasn't automatically seated, he would have qualified another way, I'm sure, because he's playing pretty good chess right now. The top two finishers in the FIDE Grand Prix, now we know who those are, Fabiano Caruana, uh, who still has his Italian flag in the Wikipedia article where I got this from, but that should be the American flag because he has uh, changed his federation back to the U.S. Chess Federation. <clears throat> Hikaru Nakamura, another uh, American player. The top two finishers in the World Chess Cup, that's coming up in September. And the two players that have the highest rating throughout 2015, who participate in either the FIDE Grand Prix or the World Chess Cup or both, um, at the end of 2015, we will know who those are. Now, I have, uh, I'm kind of nuts about this, I have an Excel spreadsheet going right now, and currently, if the tournament were held today, those people would be Topalov and Grishchuk. However, there are a couple of people within striking distance. Uh, they, they have a pretty big lead. I, I think their average rating is something like 2898 or 2798 which is pretty high up there. Um, but you have people like Geary, who's not too far behind. I think he's somewhere around 2885. You have uh, Kramnik, you have Wesley So. All of these players have an average rating so far above 2880, which means they're within striking distance. So any of those five could get in through rating if they don't get in otherwise. And then finally, there's the organizing committee's wild card. Now, the World Chess Championship is taking place in the United States. The venues have not been finalized, but it would be um, it would be pretty wise to um, envision at least St. Louis as one, if not the only host city, because the primary financial backing for the World Chess Championship is coming from Rex Sinkefeld. So the um, the person who has the highest rate, or the person who the organizers committee wants to nominate, can uh, play now. Um, personally, um, Gary Kasparov has one week left to play in a rated match and reactivate his FIDE rating and become eligible 
Come on, Gary. We're counting on you. That would that would be really interesting if you reactivate his rating because his rating is something like 2815 even today. All you'd have to do is reactivate it, and then he'd be eligible for to be nominated, but uh, he'd have to play quickly, and it's, it's not going to happen. He has too much other stuff going on, and frankly, what does he have left to prove? So there's no telling who that might be. I, I, I don't have any insight into uh, who the organizing committee is, is um, envisioning. You know, there are lots of good choices, uh, and maybe you all have your own favorites. I'd kind of like to see Gary if he doesn't get, if he doesn't qualify through another means. I think he's kind of an up and coming player, a young, um, talent. It'd be interesting to see him. Warren, do you have any preferences? If you could. Well, in terms of preferences, I don't really have any, uh, players I would really love to see, but I would not be surprised at all if Siegfeld picks a Chinese player. Hmm. Because they have not really been involved with the candidates so much, so so Ding Liren maybe. Yeah, honestly, and if if he's really interested in increasing the popularity of the game, I think that he'll he'll grab a Chinese player, Li Chao, Ding mm. Liren. Yeah, there are, are there a few there. So Wei Yi maybe twenty seven twenty five. Yeah, interesting thought. <laughs> so. We will not find that out until later, but we've got kind of a, uh, a schedule here, and you'll see when we're planning on covering each individual player, which means I have until the end of July to uh, master the proper pronunciation of Vishwanathan Anand, and if there are any uh, Hindi speakers, <laughs> I'd appreciate your guidance there. I think I'm close, but it's it's hard to say. And then uh, we'll move on to Nakamura, Karawana, and then we'll see. Uh, we'll, we'll find out who the Grand Prix winners are in late September, and then we'll know who the October and November um, people are. If we don't have an organizer's pick by December, then we'll probably have a strong idea who one of the, the top rating qualifier is. I'm sure we'll, we'll know that. Um, so we'll, we'll do that in December instead. Any questions about the upcoming? And then in April, who knows? Um, by that time, we will have done this two years, which is much longer than we anticipated, and we'll see if, uh, you know, what the interest is.